reading chapter nine of In Gold, Culture, Perception, and Cognition. I wanted to start with a question that one of you raised. Why isn't this the first chapter? Good question, actually. Especially because, right, the first thing he says is that there is one question that perhaps more than any other motivates anthropological inquiry. Oh, that seems like the first question that you should start with then in your book. It's going to be the one question to take some people, take us, we're from different backgrounds, put us in the same situation. And we're going to think differently about it. But why? <laughs> but why? Great anthropological question. And in this chapter, we see Ingold going through a kind of a mini tour of anthropology. The whole reason we're in this class or the title of this class, The History of Anthropological Thought on All of This Stuff. So I guess one could argue that this should be the first chapter. In fact, if I look on the back of the book, it says, how do people perceive the world around them? Why should their perceptions differ? So that's the whole question of the book. I guess from my perspective, I would say, you know, I mean, maybe it should be the first chapter. I would think you'd have to know, you'd already have to know quite a lot about anthropology, I think, to have this be your first chapter. Like if this were really the first chapter, wouldn't you get upset and throw the book down and be like, okay, I'm done, I've had it with this. I like the caribou better, staring me down, the caribou. I was walking up to school and I keep seeing these deer and they all turn to look at me. And I stare back at them and wonder, are they about to bolt? They don't look like they're about to run at all. I should probably see if I can projectile one of them and see what happens, they're not offering themselves up to me. Anyway, I mean, I think it could, I think it could be the first chapter, but I would say that you'd probably have to be deep into anthropology to ever want this to be the first chapter. Um, sometimes I've actually skipped this chapter because it seems too anthropology, like it's too, it's too much. Um, because for me, I think, the history of anthropological thought is uh, is meaningless unless we're going to do something with it. So I, I think he makes a, a good case for it here, for trying to understand it, for trying to get us to a different place, but it takes a while. I wanted to start off with something that is not exactly a different situation but um, going back to something that we didn't talk about when we read Brody, but sometimes I just want to turn, turn to it. It's when, it's when they're, they're drinking. They get in a, as Brody puts it, everyone gets caught up in the festivity and in a series of community-wide sprees. When they are drinking, they do so with an abandon that may astonish and frighten a stranger. It's kind of a curious chapter, a curious part of Brody, um, because he's describing community wide drunkenness. I'm aware that St. Patrick's Day is coming up, which is some sort of strange college town thing that we do um, that might be somewhat, well, it's not similar, but you know, it's a time when people 
do so with an abandon that may astonish and frighten someone who is not used to seeing people, you know, out there at 10 in the morning, maybe earlier. But he says, uh, Brody says something here, which is, I, it's in one of his odd, his odd chapters, his just narrative chapters. He says, not surprisingly, when Atz and Sam, Brian, or any of the other reserve people drink, they change. They change in every aspect of their behavior, in their facial expressions, in everything that they say. The changes are far more drastic than those in white drinkers. Which is, again, a, I, I, a curious thing to say. It's in one of his narrative chapters, so he doesn't necessarily back that up. How does he know that? Does he really, is he really able to compare the changes? Are they that, it's, it seems like a funny thing to say. Possibly this is something that has to be seen to be believed. Brody writes, and um, I guess this fits into some stereotypes that we often, that people often have about indigenous people and drinking. Brody then goes on to say that this, the, the, they're all drinking together. It's a community-wide spree, and then it stops. Then it's done. When it's over, it's over. After a week of partying comes a sickening and community-wide hangover. And then he says that after that, they are sober longer than they have been drunk, but they're not, you know, they're not fighting what we might call alcoholism, this idea that you're always having to be in a program. It just stops. And they're sober for a long time. And then, I don't know, next year, a few months later, probably seasonally, Holidays. This is a holiday. Uh, the holidays. Holidays mean parties, and parties mean heavy drinking. It comes back, and then it's done. Now, it's hard to say how to interpret this. I think in the old days, people would say, "Oh, it's a, it's a biological thing," um, and we know now that it, that. It shouldn't be, or we're not supposed to say that, but we don't really know what, how else to describe what happens to people. Now in the 1960s, a couple of anthropologists, well, inspired by this anthropologist, Dwight Heath, uh, who was doing field work in Bolivia. And he was with, uh, with some, agricultural people and every week they would sit around a room and pass around a little bottle of stuff maybe a big bottle and they just drink this shot by shot until everybody passed out and that's what they did every week and they didn't do this every night it was just every week and he took the bottle he got a bottle of this stuff it was a homemade brew he took it back to Yale or wherever it was. He got his job and I was like, what, 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 what is this stuff? And they're like, this is, this is 180 proof alcohol. This is 90% alcohol. So, you know, they've been sitting around drinking stuff that is pretty close to, you know, it's rocket fuel. And, but the thing is, is that the same stuff you could have a very different reaction in different communities. So some, you know, then he went on to study the differences. Some people get happy, some people get sad, some people, or I mean, it seems to be a social thing too, that there's a certain pattern to it. And so these anthropologists wrote, drunken comportment, a social explanation drunken behavior, that we learn, we learn what our society is, and then we become living confirmations of what our society teaches us how to do when, how to behave when we get drunk. And this is a pretty standard, 
I mean, this is a pretty standard anthropological position about almost anything you could put in there family instead of you could put almost anything in place of drunkenness and it would make sense right people learn we learn what our societies import to us and then we comport ourselves that way and then here we are little creatures of our society so again same substance but different societies different different reactions why should this be so we've decided that this is society's teachings. And Ingold takes us back through, like I said, a mini tour of the history of how anthropology has thought about this. Starting with social anthropology or British social anthropology, which somehow goes back to Emile Durkheim. It doesn't sound like a Brit, he's French. No, not French, but somewhere around there. They still make you read the elementary forms of religious life. Yeah, Dalton doesn't make you read that. <laughs> yeah this is this big this is a big book i remember looking at some of it back in college it was good stuff i mean yeah doesn't read exactly today um but the in what Ingold is getting from this, right, is that the what, what Durkheim did is he he distinguished the flux of everyday life, the sensations and their their representations, the forms. So you'd have the ones that were just senses coming at us, and the others, the way we make sense of that, the forms that are not so in flux, and that sensations were what we feel as private or as individuals but the representations we share they're public and so for Durkheim what you needed to study was not the flux of life or the individual sensations but the social forms that's why it got called social anthropology in Britain and that's what they call themselves still social anthropology. Going up into, he talks about Edmund Leach, who is a giant in social anthropology in the 19, in British social anthropology in the 1960s. So Edmund Leach wrote that given, given, or this is Ingold's paraphrase of Leach, given that the world of our immediate sensory experience is a formless and continuous flux, in which nothing is the same from one moment to the next, how can we know what we perceive? So for Leach, the flux has to be cut up into bounded chunks, fragments of the continuum of life as it is lived, and each culture cuts the flux into different chunks. And that's pretty understandable. And then you have Mary Douglas, her big book, Purity and danger. I'll make you read that. <laughs> they do make you read that. What do you remember from it? Yes. Our most famous line to think is the dirt is matter out of place right yeah yeah you know sacred profane dirt so again it's pretty much the same thing though an interesting word word she uses here a chaos a chaos of shifting impressions each of us constructs a world 
So, you know, uh, when she says that dirt is matter out of place, you have all this stuff coming through, a chaos of stuff, and we make sense of it as clean, dirty, sacred, profane, all those cultural categories to organize our world. Now, in the U.S., we don't call ourselves social anthropology and all these terms. We've kind of melded together these days. <clears throat> We call ourselves, we came to call ourselves cultural anthropology. And in part, that seems to be that the social anthropologies, they were more concerned with the systems and structures. And so they didn't bother with how things, it didn't really matter what the individuals were thinking. But in cultural anthropology, in the United States, and Ingle doesn't mention Ruth Benedict, but I think Ruth Benedict even more than Franz Boas in the sense of putting this out there as a bestseller, uh, the idea of culture uh, in 1934 into the world. She was the one who really, truly put this out there. Uh, Boas was, was not the most was not the best at writing things for a mainstream audience. And so she's really the one who, who organizes these things. But as Ingold says, this was always, in the American context, it always had, they were, we, we, we Americans, we US Americans, we were always worried about the psychological part of it. You know, we always were worried about how it, how culture became part of, or how, what was the relationship between the individual and culture? And Ingold portrays this as something of kind of, oh, that's just what those goofy psychological individualistic Americans did. Um, but I think, I think he's in some ways overlooking why we, in, we needed to, we needed to in the United States deal with this or say that it, it was something that was realized at an individual level. And this is where perhaps Boaz will help us out. Why do we need, why do you think in the United States what was going on that we needed to make sure that everybody knew that culture was something that you had as an individual? Because, because race, yeah. Because race. Or as Bonilla tells us, uh, Yori Mar Bonilla is to bring in our next book, uh, that, you know, the it wasn't that the Brits and the French were obviously they were colonial powers and sent their anthropologists to the colonies basically, or the former colonies in some cases. Um, but in terms of Boaz dealing with actively with things in the United States, interacting with other scholars like Du Bois, um, the fact that slavery actually existing enslavement had only ended, you know, 60 or 70 years before Bendix's book was written. These were still very active issues and there was still a lot of, there were still was, were, and are a lot of people who were trying to justify the the system of the, the actually existing system of US society uh, by means of culture or race uh, to argue for superiority and inferiority. In ways, like I said, you didn't, it's, it's not that the British or the French didn't have these issues, but you know, they didn't, he didn't really have to have the same kinds of laws in place and, and uh, systems of, of discrimination and the whole idea of separate but equal. I mean, it just, it was not the same 
everyday reality that people had to argue against. So in the United States, we had they there was a there was always this tension of how does how does how do people get culture? Until Clifford Geertz, interpretation of cultures, a book that sometimes we read a lot in religious studies. Um, Geertz says there's an essay in there. Uh, called religion as a symbolic system. But he has a very famous sentence in here about culture in which Gertz says, culture is not, you know, it's, it's not behavior patterns. It's a set of control mechanisms, plans, recipes, rules, instructions. What computer engineers call programs and that must have been a cool thing back then you know and this was written i mean it was published in 1973 but it was first written in 1966 so that was seen as being like way ahead of the game to be able to talk about computer programs it was like whoa the software i don't even think they called it that yet the software of computers and you'll notice as you go further into this a lot of people were trying to trying to basically back deduce the human mind from computers and this idea of the computer programs. This is a big, big deal, what they call programs. Um, but the idea is, you know, as Ingold says, basically by the time of Gertz, then you don't have to worry about the individuals anymore. It's this, it's, it's basically become the same thing that Leach and Mary Douglas are saying. They're the re recipes, rules, and instructions. And, you know, I mean, I was trying to think about this in terms of what had happened in, in the United States. In the United States, the, the, I think that by the time of the 1960s and 70s, there were a whole category of people who, you know, despite the civil rights movement, or maybe because of it, figured that the issues of race and racism had been resolved, or they were not a pressing issue for some people in their everyday life as they may have been before. So... They were free to kind of join the join the Brits in this very abstract. Don't worry about what individuals are doing. And so, I think this forms the basis. This idea that Gertz had and and others uh, is the basis of a lot of different disciplines that we have today. Uh, I think it comes up in linguistics, which is basically the idea that we are studying the rules of language. We're not studying how I speak or you speak. We're studying the, the general principles behind that that generates our thought. Of course, in anthropology, the idea that you know we're, we're studying are these representations, public in public representations which shape our life, psychology, the structures of the mind. And in biology, that what we're supposed to be studying is the, we'll talk about this more, is the, is the genotype or the genomic code and the genomic changes. And we don't really worry so much what the animals or the plants look like anymore. It all comes down to their, their coding and their plans and the systems that govern their behavior. Now, that has been an issue, but it leads to uh, to a bunch of things that just never seem to go away, insoluble issues. Oh, I love that PowerPoint gave me this as an insoluble issue. Not sure why. I think it's because these foods don't dissolve into each other, or maybe I'm using the word wrong. There they are. They continue to be a stew rather than a, or no, they're not stewing together. Anyway. <laughs> A number of things come up from this that just, they, they never seem to be resolved. So one of the first fun things that happened is that when people started talking about, oh, we're gonna find out the rules, the rules for, for how people categorize the world, there was this whole research agenda in, uh, in cognitive anthropology where you'd go out and you'd like, you'd have this deck of cards and you'd lay down a card and it had a picture of a frog on it or something. And you'd be like, what, 
and you'd have all these pictures and you'd ask people to sort out which animals belonged with each other and give me more examples. And does this go with that? Ken Gold basically says this. They would say, you know, uh, and Ingold just sort of, he doesn't, he doesn't tell you how fun this seemed to be. Uh, the principles of classification are arbitrary and subjective. They're to be discovered through the formal analysis of responses provided by native informants to a series of questions in the form, is this thing here a kind of X? Is this frog like a cow? What other kinds of cows are there? Is cow a kind of you know, it was fun because you had all these pictures and you'd be sorting through things. And it seemed to like make these discoveries because you're like, whoa, they're grouping together cows and elephants. Who would do that? That's, but they're putting frogs in, well, I don't know. Now those things do seem the same to me, but you know, they'd be putting things together in different ways and you'd come up with all this stuff. But the problem was that as in Gold says, it didn't really seem to have anything to do with how they were actually living their lives. And so you could, you, uh, as he put it, a great deal of energy goes into these recordings of these mental structures, but it didn't really tell us about how people were living their lives. And when I tried to do this, it was just like seen as the stupidest thing that you, I was never able to get them to sort anything out into any categories because they're like, this is dumb. So uh, it didn't, that didn't work. The other thing is, is that it never explains like, okay, well, if we're all just creatures, little creatures of our culture, then how come there's all this individual variation? What accounts for all the people who aren't getting drunk at all on St. Patrick's Day, right? Why, how come everybody's responding differently to these things if we're the same? And various people tried to work this out. Uh, Benedict famously kind of said that, you know, most people fit into their cultural pattern, but they're, you know, but in every society, there's going to be people who are different and, and then they will be, they, they will be seen as kind of outcasts or beyond. And it's our job to at least show that that's possibly part of the human experience as well, but it could never really be, it was always difficult to explain how one would have cultural variation. I should mention that, well, this goes with the next part is, you know, where, where's the boundaries of this? So for the cognitive anthropologist it's like, well, once the people stop categorizing frogs and dogs together, then we know we've hit a different kind of culture. But again, it was like, well, what, what about people who kind of can seem to effortlessly go back and forth or be speak three or four different languages? Um, you know, where, and so people then got into all kinds of little tiny subdivisions like subcultures, but there was always this issue of where we drew the boundary around these things. Oh, this was weird. This was something I never quite, I, I could still don't completely understand, but it's the critique of cultural relativism from the perspective of um, if we, it's basically the idea that uh, many anthropologists have that, you know, that we're biologically able to take on all kinds of different forms of life. And it's our culture that gives us that form. That's why we can all be different. Uh, what Dan Sperber said is that a creature capable of taking on not just one form of life, but any one of a very large number of possible alter alternative forms would require more rather than less by way of innate programming. Like if I'm gonna be able to, to do all kinds of different forms of life, then I have to have the innate mechanisms already there to be able to take on upon, take on all this stuff. So that was hard. Another huge problem was that, you know, even the simplest tasks, and there is this great critique that uh, Bourdieu did of Marvin Harris, who tried to record, I think he tried to record what it was like to watch his, his wife cooking a meal. And in 20 minutes, he had like 50 pages of notes about all the activities that she was doing. 
it's that you know you can't you can't tell somebody it's impossible to transmit culture via talking to people as a rule or as a recipe oh there it is that's another reason this picture works so well it's a recipe the insoluble food so i mean as you as we know like we're always we seem to always be debating with people okay is it is it biology or is it culture? I mean, we're still talking about that up to this day because we're still stuck in this idea that culture is recipes and rules. And so we're, as long as culture remains recipes and rules, we're gonna be stuck with this, you know, well, how much of it is innate and how much is it given in our environment? And we're gonna be stuck with where are the boundaries and how do you get variation within it? We'll never figure it out. So Ingold brings in some, some dissidents. Our first buddy, of course, is perhaps our most famous dissident, Pierre Bourdieu. The Practice Theory, his most famous book, An Outline of a Theory of Practice. And here we're talking about the habitus which in other places I've told you is very difficult to understand. I think it still is, but Ingold maybe makes it more understandable here than Bourdieu himself. So according to Ingold on Bourdieu, the habitus is not expressed in practice, it rather subsists in it. So it's only because it's the activity. So it's not that you're sort of have realized something in your head or in your cultural model and your recipe that then becomes the habitus. It's part of your situation in that habit environment life, which in, in, in everyday terms can be stuff like the way we walk. How oh, we did that in cultural anthropology the way we walk, different forms of walking, tilt of the head. There's Bourdieu tilting his head there. <laughs> Facial expressions, ways of sitting, the ways our bodies are trained. When one of my, when my my wife's colleagues in graduate school always used to say that she immediately knew the, uh, I don't know if middle class is the correct word, maybe the upper class students because they sit down in a certain way and pull out their pen in a certain way and write in a certain, it was all, and it just seemed so natural. And if you weren't part of that, world it was and again Bourdieu gets used a lot in education and and social class because he talks about these things that become so natural to us but are actually historical so our famous friend Bourdieu the biggest rock star we have or had And then James Gibson, another dissident that nobody in anthropology knows about and is kind of a dissident or a different voice in psychology. I once asked a student or no, they took it up upon themselves to interview the psychologists at Hartwick about James Gibson. And he has some currency, people are like, they seem to think he was an interesting person. Um, for Ingold, what Gibson does is talk about perception not as something that you just sit there and perceive things or that we perceive across the, uh, we, we get input from the world, but then, but we get things as we move about. The perception entails movement. 
And so if perception entails movement, then perception is a mode of action rather than a prerequisite for action. Oh, that's kind of reminded me of that whole passage in Brody about making decisions and decisions being taken in the doing. So we usually think about decisions as being something we perceive something, we think about it, and then we take action. But if we need to be moving, if we need to be active in order to perceive, then that kind of turns that on its head. So we have to, we have to act, we're acting and perceiving and engaging all at the same time. Interestingly, um, he says here on page 167 that that's, this is what makes anthropological fieldwork possible. You can never be in the heads of the people that you are studying with. So this is from an anthropologist named Michael Jackson. I have to look that person up. Michael Jackson. I always get excited when I read about him. By using one's body in the same way as others in the same environment, one finds oneself informed by an understanding which may then be interpreted according to one's own custom or bent, yet which remains grounded in a field of practical activity and thereby remains consonant with the experience of those among whom one has lived. So, you know, actually putting the, that old expression of walking a mile in somebody else's shoes, experiencing something in the same place and environment as someone else, and, and hopefully then being able to at least talk to people about it while you're doing it uh, also helps. Although a lot of times people don't have much to say when they're doing something because it seems natural, but you can at least be there. You can at least feel feel those sensations by putting yourself in that place. So an interesting dissident there. I could think it says anthropology really hasn't, hasn't drawn upon him that much, although perhaps we should. And then our buddies, the philosophers, specifically the phenomenologists, Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, who are talking about total bodily immersion from the start in an environment. So this is the critique of the Cartesian duality that begins with, I think, therefore I am. I guess I'm, I would say this is what? I'm a body, therefore I am. Something like that. Our total bodily immersion. I'm not sure if this is exactly, I don't think Ingold quotes from being in time here. He quotes from somebody reviewing Heidegger. Is that what he got out of being in time? Bodily immersion in an environment. More environment, yeah, okay. Body's Merleau-Ponty, we're about to get to him. Yeah, more like, oh, that funny, is this what the cover of your book looked like or was it, yeah? Oh, I had that other one with the black and white cover. Huh, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, so yeah, it's about certainly being a being, being, being immersed in an environment. All right, well, anyway, Heidegger, yay. And there, Merleau-Ponty, his big work, Phenomenology of Perception, which is, again, bodily immersion from the start in an environment that's our existential condition. I think he's probably the best looking of the people so far, right? <laughs> the coolest name that's for sure i mean i think i can never pronounce it correctly so we have these and then we also have someone we've seen before gregory bateson that it's not simply that our minds are encased here and our 
the world is out there, but we're constantly reaching with our mind into the world and back and forth. And so the idea that the world comes to us simply as this chaos or flux of sensations is actually not how we experience the world. And we don't experience it that way just because we have a bunch of mental categories, it's because we're, we've already been immersed and grown up in that world. So we have these three dissidents in philosophy. I guess Bateson's more like a dissident in anthropology. There he is, steps to an ecology of mind. So what I think these folks give to us, I think Ingold is correct, that they give us a different way to explain, okay, if people are behaving differently when they are ingesting a similar substance, 180 proof stuff, or hopefully not, more like maybe 40 proof or 6%, that there's, it can't be, it would be hard for me to imagine how drunken behavior is handed down as, a, right, I mean, nobody, you don't, your parents <laughs> don't usually tell you how to behave when drunk. Sometimes, sometimes they do, but I don't know. Usually they just tell you don't. So it's hard to imagine this being handed down from society as a propositional statement. And so when we learn how to do even something like this, we're always with other people all together with sometimes with our elders. Yeah, even with that. Yeah, with others, with our peers. And as Ingold has been telling us in a specific environment with some deer and other creatures around a specific place. And if I think back, if we think back to Brody's example, you know, what would, what would influence people to have this system in which you get just raucously drunk the whole community for like a week during a specific period of time, and then you're sober for months. And then boom, happens again. And, you know, I think that the, my feeling is it, it may have a lot to do with the rhythms of the fur trade, that there'd be these, you know, lots of stuff coming in at certain moments of the year when people met each other and had an exchange and then all of a sudden you have money and you have booze and you have all this stuff and fur trade of course was fueled by alcohol, and weapons and all kinds of other good stuff, blankets too. But that, you know, I mean, in some ways over the generations, this is how you'd experience the and learn, socially learn how to, how to be, how to have a party. So, but, you know, I mean, we always have to keep in mind that there's going to be people who are different that are, that do that for a while and then don't or have never done it or look on their society critically, um, who, try to reflect upon their society and change so that all these things are in, in process. At the end of this chapter, well, at the end of this chapter, a couple things happen. One thing happens, which I call the big hug between anthropology and psychology, because according to Ingold, I can see no further intellectual justification for continuing to separate these disciplines. We recognize that thinking, perceiving, remembering, and learning are in their environment. We recognize that the mind is not in advance of a social world. So psychological and social processes are one and the same.
what are they still doing over there? And where, have you ever taken any psychology? No. I don't even know where they are anymore. They have to go down to Anderson, and have those big classes of a hundred people to start out with. That's the only thing I know. So this hasn't worked out so well. I have two people today, one, they have a hundred. That's probably why they haven't joined together with me in a new discipline, a discipline that doesn't even have a name yet, a discipline that will be called into being to study these processes, whatever we choose to call it. We're gonna study how people perceive, act, think, know, learn, remember. This doesn't seem to have worked out very well. There's no new discipline. We haven't called it anything. Have we? Have I missed something? No, it's been how many years? 30 years? 50 years? No, maybe 30, 20. 20 to 30 years ago, we were going to call into being a new discipline, whatever we choose to call it. Didn't happen at all. Um, you know, and Ingold says there's a number of obstacles, one of which is translating this approach into a research program. It's hard to translate this and resources get organized academically speaking in certain ways. So uh, yeah, this hasn't happened. 